Well, hello and a warm welcome to this BA Community webinar recording. You're no doubt here to re-watch or watch for the first time the recording of Back to the Feature, a practical guide to iterative analysis with Stuart Mann. And an excellent webinar it is too. Before you watch it, I just wanted to make you aware that due to a slight technical issue on the evening, we had to re-record the first 15 or 20 minutes. Now, this won't, you won't miss anything. It's still an excellent and insightful webinar, but if you watched it live and you're now re-watching it, you might find a few subtle differences in the first 15 or 20 minutes. So, I'm sure you'll enjoy the webinar. I wanted to say a massive thank you to Stuart for re-recording the first 15 or 20 minutes, which was, again, due to a, a largely um, human technical error. Um, and with that, I will hand you over to Stuart and um, enjoy the webinar. Hi, I'm uh, Stuart Mann. I'm going to take you back to the feature or I guess back to the recording. So no doubt uh, Adrian informed you we had a technical glitch last night, missed the first part, uh, we didn't record the first part of the webinar, so I'm re-recording it uh, this, this morning, hence uh, the wardrobe change. Um, great, so yeah, we're going to do back to the feature, practical guide to iterative analysis. This is everything you need to know about me in uh, one slide. So I'm an agile coach. I've uh, been doing that for, for several years. Before that, I, I, I managed a large analysis uh, team. Um, I enjoy running marathons. I managed to complete 251 uh, to date. I'm a father of two girls, husband and one wife, a trainee feminist. Maybe there's a correlation there. My worthy lifetime ambition to secure a beer sponsor hasn't happened yet. Uh, but yeah, yeah, put things out to the universe. You never know what, what might happen. And interestingly enough, um, I have actually seen a DeLorean in real life. Obviously, DeLorean features very prominently in the Back to the Future trilogy. Uh, during one of the, the marathons, I ran a 50k uh, race between the town of Middleburg in Mpumalanga uh, and the Lost Corp Dam. Uh, there was a DeLorean parked at the side of the road at one of the support tables. So I, I stopped, admired it, and, and took a few uh, pictures. Great. So um, let's get going. Just one, uh, I guess, disclaimer. Um, I know Adrian was was worried about copyright infringements and having his YouTube uh, channel uh, taken uh, taken down for for copyright. So um, from the original presentation, what I've done is I've used AI images, so played around a bit with that uh, to get uh, around the potential copyright issues. Um, as you'll see here, some of them uh, uh, created uh, reasonably well, some of them uh, quite uh, strange, uh, yeah, and some of them you can kind of uh, see. Uh, quite closely what actually the the, the the reference to the scenes inside the movie so i will try to tie in with the with the movie trilogy uh during the course uh of of the presentation okay, with the with, with the topic so to get going um starting with with an uh, basically just a little exercise um to illustrate the difference between outputs and outcomes which is one of the central themes uh through the through the through the webinar <clears throat> so let's consider the scenario that you are part of my feature team, I'm your product owner, and I come to you and I say, right, um, I want you, or well, you're part of the PowerPoint uh, feature team, Microsoft PowerPoint, and I come to you and say, right, I have a nice simple feature, I just want you to create me a shortcut key to add a bullet point list inside PowerPoint. Okay, obviously it can't be control B, because that's gonna turn things bold in the, in the office suite of products. Now, when I did ask this in the live recording, and I've asked this many times when I've done this exercise, it's incredibly rare that anyone will know what it is. In fact, I don't think anyone's ever known what the bullet point is. So when I ask this question, do you know what it is? And originally I actually thought there was none. They eventually did add one. The bullet, the bullet, the shortcut key is control shift L, which is obviously very, very hard to remember. I assume it's the L is because there are two L's in bullet. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you've got better things to store in your brain than control shift L to, to, to add a bullet, which is why none of us probably use that shortcut key or even knew um, that, that it was there. Now, there is another way to add shortcuts, and this is something that we all do. Even if you wouldn't think about it directly, you just do it intuitively. You'll do it automatically without even thinking, just because it just makes a lot more sense. And that would be to do an asterisk or a hyphen, and then a space or a tab will create those bullet points lists for you in PowerPoint and Word and the other Office products. So much easier, does exactly the same thing, but much more logical and intuitive, and you don't need to think about it and try to remember Control-Shift-L. So what I want to illustrate now is the difference between this top 
feature description, create a shortcut key to add a bullet point list in PowerPoint, and then the bottom one, which is an unconstrained feature, which would be allow users to create bullet points as easy as possible. Now they seem very, very similar, but there's obviously a subtle difference. The top one in red, that is just an output. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm coming and I'm saying, here's the solution. I just want you to act like a cog in a machine and go and do this thing for me. I've already thought it out. Don't need to think, you just need to do. Whereas the bottom one is an unconstrained feature or an outcome. What is the business need? Understanding the why and then producing the best possible solution to solve that business need. So obviously one of the ways we could create bullet points is via a shortcut key, but it's not the best way. Okay. The best way would be asterisk, hyphen, and, and space. Much easier, much more logical, much more intuitive uh, for, for users. Now, very often what happens in our organizations is that features come to teams like this one on the top in the red. Don't think, just do. But what we want to happen is to for features to come through as outcomes, as problems to be solved so the teams can understand the why and we can unleash the diversity and creativity of our teams in coming up with great solutions for business problems. Now, what I'll be doing throughout the, um, the, the session is referring to a real world example. It was actually one of, one of my um, entry into the world of Agile, one of the first things we did was doing password reset. So this is a live, this is a, a real life system. It's a transactional banking system. And they had a problem or, or an issue, I guess, that they were getting about three and a half thousand calls per month to the call center. And 99% of those were for password reset. So this is a multinational banking system, billions of dollars going through the system on a daily basis, but there's no self-service password reset that people have to find the call center. And obviously that's consuming massive capacity on and, and resources in order to do so. So it would make sense to build a, a feature, a self-service password reset feature. So we'll be exploring this um, throughout, uh, the, throughout the webinar. Now, before we go there and, and proceed with password reset, I just wanted to define the definitions I'll be using tonight. So I'm gonna use the safe definition, scale agile, um, but you might have different ones. That's perfectly okay. You know what you call what I call a, a feature. You might call it user story or an epic. It doesn't really matter what you call it, but just so that you know, and, and we're on a common uh, um, uh, basis for for the webinar. Uh, this is the definition that I'll be using. So a feature I would define as a potentially usable chunk of value, normally from the end user's point of view. So consider password reset, the ability to reset my password securely without talking to a human. Okay. Now, the way that Google does it is different to the way that Facebook does it, different to the way Tinder does it, different to the way your bank account does it, and, and so on and so forth. But the need is universal. Now, you would probably expect that uh, that your bank, or you probably hope that your bank has got more security on than your Tinder account, but I don't know, depends what you get up to in your private time. Maybe you need more security uh, on your social media accounts. Um, but it, you, you, so there are lots of different ways, lots of different solutions and potential options and methods to do password reset, but the need is universal. So how it's actually done could be context specific to the users of a site, of a service, uh, but the need is, is, is universal. Now, a user story, and although it's called a user story, very often there's system value at the uh, uh, with it with a user story would be something like lock account, validate user, update audit log, and potentially a host of other stories would come off. Now, your stories here are the minimum set of functionality that needs to be in place in order to realize the benefit of the feature. As a user. I don't care that you've locked my account, you validated me and you've updated the audit log. What do I care about? Can I reset my password and log back in to the system? That's what I care about. Okay, so that's what, that's what I want. So, but with these stories, what we can do is, let's just say there are 20 stories related to password reset and we've done 18 in our first sprint or 18 are done, even if you're not following an agile method. Well, you know that you're pretty close to being done and done means fully built, fully tested. If we've only done two out of uh, out of the 20, well, we know we've still got a long way to go. So it's nice and easy to, to do progress. Um, just maybe a quick note on the user story. So there's some, yeah, um, you know, sometimes people say, hang on, um, you know, should we write it in this format? 
uh, in the you know the as a as a format. Um, up to you as to as to how you do it. I generally find that if you're doing stories as very small chunks of functionality, you can write in plain English, but sometimes you might actually want to do your feature inside that format. So whatever works for for you, for your team, as long as it's clear, it's unambiguous, and the the team who are going to be doing the work uh, have got a clear understanding about what, what is actually required. That's the most important thing. So what's going to result in the maximum probability and the fastest flow of value? Now, an epic would be something that's much bigger. So you could have an epic like improve self-service on your system, and that would then mushroom out into lots of different features. Okay, um, you know, if you're building a system from scratch, you might have an epic, but you don't have to. Now, the important thing is this is where we get the value for the for the user. So you could have password reset without going through business cases and a whole lot of other things to get approvals. You can have a high value feature. That, that comes in, that's perfectly okay. Just another way of thinking of this, if you if you still struggle with the concept, look as epic as being potentially like a season of a television show. Feature would be like an episode and a story would be like a scene. So every scene that's completed needs to be closer to airing the episode. But as a user or as a viewer, I don't want to watch each scene by scene. I want to watch the completed episode. And I think this actually this analogy works quite well for for analysis as well because if you think you've got to write the script up front, similar to analysis, well we've got to do some understanding about what we're going to do, but actually the script might adapt a bit when we go into filming. So you still want the the script writers to be involved, and they you know you might go and adapt, and things might be practical, or someone might have a better idea when we actually in the implementation or the filming the filming phase. So I think it's quite a quite a nice analogy to to kind of use. Now, just to get philosophical for a, for a short while, uh, what is the meaning of life? Nice, simple answer there. We want to add value. How do we add value in a software or solution team? And that is by adding features. Okay, so features, because they are the chunks of functionality, it might have this big epic out there, but every feature that I add in, so for example, if I add in password reset, fantastic. Now our users can reset their, their passwords uh, not nice and easily. Other self-service functions might take a lot longer to deliver, but every chunk, every feature that gets done, if we can take it through into our production system, get into the hands of our customers, that's the way that we're adding value. So we want to optimize around that. How can we get features to flow fast through our system and to get them into the hands of our customers in the most efficient manner? Now, next thing I want to explore is feature hypotheses. So there are two definitions on the screen. I prefer the philosophical one, so I'll focus on that. So it's a proposition made as a basis for reasoning without any assumption of its truth. Now, what does that mean? Okay, so that basically means that we don't want to go into solution mode. We don't want to be overconfident in what will happen. We want to say, we think this will happen. If we do this, we believe or we think that this will be the intended result. Now, if we do get a false result, that doesn't mean it's a failed experiment. Because we've learned something, we've learned something that doesn't work, and we can yeah, change our approach. The only failed experiment is where we don't get enough information back to know whether your hypothesis is true or false. Okay, so that's what we try to do with an hypothesis: is to go and test something and to can get fast feedback on that. Now, in the case of something like password reset, in this scenario, a good feature hypothesis would be something like: if we provide the users the ability to reset their own password, call center volumes will drop by ninety percent. Why is that a good feature hypothesis? Well, we can test it very, very quickly. So as we'll see, see later on, if you go into, once you go into production, you can very quickly go and see what are the results on our call center volumes. Are we seeing the, the um, a drop and are we seeing a drop of 90%? So, so we can get fast feedback on that. A bad hypothesis would normally be a monetary value. So similar to the one previous, but here we're saying we'll save 800,000 Rand a month. Okay, this could be dollars, euros, pounds, whatever, whatever money fee value. Now, the reason why I would say this is a bad hypothesis is because it's very difficult to get the results afterwards. So occasionally you can, and if you can, it's great to do it in a, you know, a financial way to go and see direct cause and effect. But often these cost savings or these expected cost savings that might take months, they might never materialize in any case because people get redeployed to other things or other stuff happens. So much, much harder to go and measure that afterwards, which is normally why people don't. So uh, it's very, very rare you see in a business case, which is normally always written as a cost saving or a revenue increase. It's very, very 
seldom that someone actually goes and measure it, measure the, uh, it afterwards in practice. Okay, so much harder, much longer times. So this is quick, this is long, or sometimes actually impossible to go and measure. Okay, so try to keep your hypotheses such that they can be measured quickly afterwards. Now, in terms of iterative uh, development, iterative analysis, this is the analogy that I like to use. So let's just say you're going away for a nice weekend, away somewhere, you've got a long weekend, um, and you've booked a fancy hotel, and you're using the, the shower for the first time in, in your hotel. If you've got long learning cycles and you're doing traditional ways of work, traditional analysis, it's the equivalent of having one chance to turn on those taps. So you turn them on, it might be scorching hot, it might be freezing cold, you might have got the temperature just right in the first go, but what are the chances? Not good. Now, obviously, in practice, we don't do that. So what do we do? We turn on the taps, we feel, and we adjust and we adjust until we get the temperature just right. And that's really what we're trying to do with iterative analysis and iterative development. We want to test the water as frequently as possible, because the faster we learn, the faster we can respond, the faster we learn, the faster we're likely to deliver value. And this happens on two levels. So the one is if you do have an existing system and you can put functionality out there quickly, test it with the users. If you're doing things like A-B testing or you can do dark launches and things like that. You can actually test with a small group of users to see if it actually works um, and, and so on to get very, very fast feedback. But it also works when you are in, in the build phase. If you are building something significantly big and you can't get it into, directly into the hands of your users with things like prototyping, which could be low, low fidelity or high fidelity prototyping to continually test. Also, in doing so, if we're focusing on working software, this also gives us a good indication of progress. The example I used earlier, if we've got 20 stories to go and build, we want to make sure that we and, and um, we, we can get a, a good idea of exactly where we're at. If you're doing something significant, maybe it's going to take six months, something really, really big that's going to build. And after you're even in the first two weeks, if you're doing things like two week sprints, you'll get an idea, hang on a minute, our, our six month target is is actually already looking doubtful. Um, this is going to take a year. Do we want to continue? Okay, so you want to get fast feedback the whole way along. So think about that concept. We're testing the water. Okay, so let's return back to uh, pass it reset. There we've got our feature hypothesis nice and clear. Now, the next question I want to ask is, how can we break this into smaller features? And what impact would that have on our hypothesis? Now, we might say, why do we want to break it into smaller features? And the reason for that is very, very simple, is that Lean 101, or Lean Fundamentals, will tell you that smaller items flow faster through systems. So the smaller we can make our feature, the faster it's going to flow through, and therefore the faster we're going to get value. Okay, so that's that's ideally what we would what we would like to do is to try and break things break things down. Now the good news is when it comes to features, breaking up is easy to do. So some potential ways if you looked at password reset, you might do it by method. Okay, it's password reset by email, via SMS or text message, USSD, biometrics, and so on. You might do it by user type, normal user, super user. If you're a bank and you've got people who can approve multi-billion dollar cross-border payments, well, and they want to reset their password, you probably want to check, uh, make make very sure that it is they are who they say they are um, with a channel, okay? So browser or mobile app. And then maybe by scenario, forgotten my password, I need more security than if I do still uh, know, know my current password. Now, very quickly here, You've got four by two by two by two, 32 features. So features are living things. They go, you start off with something that's big and we're gonna break it down smaller and we might end up, in this case, we've got 32. Now we might even break it down smaller again. Uh, this is just an example for illustrative purposes. You might look at your mobile app and say, okay, iOS, Android, Huawei. Suddenly now we're timesing the 32 by three and we've got close to 100 features. Okay, so whatever is appropriate, that that's, that's what you do. But ideally what we want is to be then focusing on very, very small chunks or, or, or as small as possible features that will add value. So if we decide to do password reset via email for a normal user on the browser where they've forgotten that password as our first feature, the whole team is focused on that. Okay, we're not having workshops to understand and uh, how USSD is working because that's going to distract us and create fires and, and other issues that, and, and distract us from the goal of getting our first feature out. Fully built, fully tested, that should go through really, really quickly, okay, because, yeah, 
really, really quickly because we focused uh, on it. We're not getting distracted by other things. Now, the moment that we've got that fully built, fully tested, and if we've got a full a continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline, we might be able to take it straight to into, into production and let users start resetting their password that way. And then we might say, right, second, we're going to do email, normal user, mobile app, forgotten password. Now, all we've got to do in this case is we're adding the mobile app. We know everything else works. We've got automated tests. We've built it. We've tested it. Fantastic. All that works. We're just solving this problem here. And then we go on to the next one and the next one. So we iteratively adding on to our working solution, as opposed to trying to do all of this as a mega feature all at once, which will probably take months to go through and we'll have, we have get all sorts of distractions and fires that need to be put out. And those fires will be much, much bigger. So risk increases exponentially with size. You know, so for example, half the size is not half the risk. It's probably about a quarter of, of, of the risk. Um, just to just to illustrate, um, the organization I'm in uses SAFE, if anyone's familiar with that, scale, Scaled Agile. So we do uh, program increments. And this is just a nice little trick that you can do. I just thought I'd share this. So in the iterations, we do O-looks. Well, so not all of our teams, but some of our teams do this. So actually what they do is at the end of every two-week sprint, okay, which SAFE would call an iteration, is saying what are we actually going to be able to see? So what functionality will be fully built, fully tested that we can actually see? It's just a nice little trick uh, that, that, that you can do. Okay, so further to expand on this, so I'm just going to do a simple one with password reset. In a simple system, we've got three options. Okay, we've got email, text message, and USSD. Some people might not even know what USSD is. Okay, so it's when it like pops up with a, you know, it's just like a monochrome screen on your mobile phone. So it uses much less data and, and so on. So it's quite popular, particularly in countries like Kenya, they use it as their primary method um, in PESA and things like that um, for, for, for banking and for communication. So we we'll then have a discussion with our product owner saying what's the most important and our team saying what's the most complex. Now I'm going to keep it very simple in my example and say email is the most important and it's the easiest to do. So you'll see here we've adjusted the 90% down to 60%. Obviously the inference is that we will then end up get the, the remaining 30% with the, with the other two options. Now these sit in our backlog and we throw all our energy and attention to delivering password reset via email. So hopefully it goes through nice and quickly and we get it out. Now, a few uh, questions, I'll do these rhetorically. Um, how do we know what the percentage drop is? When we go live in production, we should see from the first day, we should start seeing a drop in our call center volumes. And definitely after the first week, we would expect to see it much, much lower. Okay, if we don't, okay, then, we would want to investigate. So immediately we're going to get that feedback as to has our feature delivered, been successful, or has, is our experiment su successful? If we <coughs> are waiting to see if we're saving money, okay, it's very hard to prove, and we, that might take months until we eventually see that. So we're getting very, very fast feedback. We're testing the water uh, straight away. So, great, we get... We thought we'd get 60, but actually we got 90%. So what happens now? Now, the answer is these two features sitting on our backlog, we might still leave them there, but they become much less important. So the priority of them drops down. We might do them in a year's time, six months time. So it's a good thing that we didn't go and do architectural diagrams and design for USSD because they're going to go stale and requirements might have changed by, <laughs> by the time that we eventually decide to do this in, yeah, let's just say six, six months time. And all the time that we spent doing that was at the expense of delivering functionality, delivering value uh, for, our, for our users. So even if we never do these, all we've wasted is a few seconds of time writing up these story cards. So we can, we can live with that. Um, other side of the coin, oh dear, we only got a 10% drop. We thought we'd get 60, we only got 10, 10%. Now, what happens in this case? Now, the answer is not necessarily that these become high priority. It might be the case. So it might be just we didn't understand our users. No one uses email anymore. We've got to give them other options. Otherwise, they're just not going to use it. But it could be something else. Maybe it's because no one knows that this functionality is there. So we've got to train our call center staff that when people phone up for, for password resets is that they walk them through the process. 
It could also be that we built it so badly that actually it's easier to phone the call center than to reset the password myself. Now, if that's the case, we definitely don't want to go and build these on top of a poor solution because then we've got more knitting to unstitch when you finally find out that we've got, got, got something wrong. It could also be actually all the emails in the system are wrong, so no one's getting the emails or something like that. Okay, so those are the, the, it could be many, many things. We want to go and investigate, be curious, and find out what the actual problem is. Now, you also might find some interesting results. You might find one region, one demographic. You know, maybe you find people below a certain age don't use email. So it's actually just not working there. Um, or you might find, let's just say, I used the example of Kenya earlier. Okay, they're not using it because they all want a USSD solution. Um, that's the way that they communicate, do business, and so on there. So actually, we thought we'd do text message second, but actually now USSD becomes higher priority because it's to say Kenya is a strategic market for us. We want to cater for those users. So um, if we think about our feature now and a feature card, we've got password reset via email. We've got our hypothesis, which we've covered already. And then we'd come up with some acceptance criteria. Now, some examples here, and these would also evolve over time. We might just start with this first one. The authenticator user must be able to reset that password and log back onto the system without talking to a call center. Now, notice it's not providing the solution. It's provide, stating the problem or what needs to happen. So it's almost like how you would UAT it, but it is not the solution. Now, a lot of people, they go straight into solution mode. So what you're trying to do, solution mode is when you break down to stories. Here, we're still trying to define what needs to be done. Now, one of our testers in discussion might say, hang on a minute, because they need to normally see things in a in a in a more negative or pessimistic light. They say, what happens? What about fraud? What do we need to do? Now we might have a discussion and say, yes, we need to it needs to be secure. And we might then evolve that. Now we are getting into a bit more of a solution here, saying a full log of all password reset steps and activities must be kept for audit and security purposes. We're still not designing it, but we're saying, okay, this is what needs to happen. Okay, we wear for compliance or whatever, this is what we need. And then uh, we might do a non-functional as well, something like the password reset email must be sent within half a second of the user clicking submit. Now, obviously, the non-functionals you normally can build automated tests for, but one and two are kind of like more like UA UAT uh, type criteria. And really, that's for most features the maximum amount of documentation that you need. Now, occasionally you might have very complicated business rules or things like that that you might have a document for, but for on a feature level. That is typically all you need in terms of written documentation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, Adrian in the introduction mentioned the Agile Manifesto, um, which is on the screen, 68 words, but gets misinterpreted a lot. So we wanted to focus on working software with comprehensive documentation. Now, some people interpret this as being no documentation. Okay, it's not saying that. In fact, if you read at the bottom, or well, documentation is not important in Agile, it says here, there's value in the items on the right but we value the items on the left more. So what does this mean in the context of the Agile Manifesto? It means that ultimately working software is where we get our value. When something is in the hands of the customer, that's when we get our value. Documentation should be directly in support of getting value. If we're doing documentation, which developers don't need to use and testers don't need to write test cases, well, it's actually a waste. Now, also, if you are doing um, if there's good communication in the team, there's collaboration, you can get away with a lot less documentation. And also if you go straight from those discussions around our feature into the build, because then you don't have stuff that's sitting on the shelf for six months where you're trying to capture all the knowledge. I, I have had situations where I used to manage a large analysis team, use cases which were over 100 pages long, which sat there for a year and a half. Those were always the biggest nightmare when they went into the development phase. Um, everyone was, would think everyone else is an idiot because, and it's just, it's not, it's not, no one, no one's, uh, no one's wrong. The system is broken in, in those cases. Okay. So, and we'll look a bit more about what is the appropriate level of documentation. So you can get away with a lot less documentation. Now, also it's important that analysis is always needed, but documentation or lots of documentation is not always needed. So that's a key point as well. So in uh, the back to the future films, I think the first one finishes off with a, with the quote, roads, where we're going, we don't need roads. So I've just paraphrased this for the purposes of this presentation, written documentation with what we're building, we don't need written documentation. 
with a little asterisk there, the fine print much. So we do need some, but we don't need a lot of written documentation. And as I said, this is pretty much what you can, what you need from a feature point of view. Okay, so it's quick. The value is in the discussion to get you. It's going to evolve over time, and it's collaborative in the way that we come up with this. Now, just to illustrate this point about how why written documentation is not that great is because humans just don't read stuff. We got, especially we were bombarded with lots of things. So I, I was um, at a conference. I was presenting actually at a conference at the Scrum, the South African Scrum User Group earlier this year. And one of the vendors, they had a nice gourmet coffee. So you didn't have to do the stuff out the urns. Um, and I was uh, there. I think I, I think I got the second cup of coffee that they brewed on day one. And um, the person behind me, so I, I looked, I actually did read the, the thing. They said, I was waiting for my coffee. And they said, do you have almond milk? Okay, so you can see there, it's quite clear there is written there, almond milk is available on request, but that person didn't didn't read the sign that was straight in front of it. So I just use that as illustration presenting. Just you know, a lot of people just don't see because they're bombarded with so, many, so much information. They don't actually read stuff properly. So in this case, it might have been better if they actually put a picture of almonds on. Okay, so pictures speak a thousand words. That would probably make it clearer. The other thing which I did is I just they had four types of coffee here. So I asked people when I presented on day two, almost everyone there would have had a cup of coffee by that stage. What were the four items that they listed there? And people were guessing, but it was pure guesses. No one had actually knew. Uh, and it's uh, that's what they listed, but they did have cappuccinos, but they weren't there. They had hot chocolates. So yeah, also often you've got these uh, production defects with what's advertised on your documentation is not actually what's inside the inside the system. So just that was a good example. Now we are later in the day, um, and I did mention I would try to do a little bit of beer tie into today's presentation. So often another thing, if you want to get um, what sometimes was quite frustrating when you're attending an evening function and there's like a bar and people go and they take too long. So there's a long queue. You know, people ask, well, what beers do you have? So a much better way is if you display the beers. You can, uh, you know, you don't have to list them. You don't have to write them down. So very often the pictures are much more better. You can see it. You can automatically go, okay, that's the one that I want. So just a couple of just very, very uh, uh, simple um yeah, kind of illustrations about how yeah, pictures are much better with dealing with humans and getting fast responses um, and so on. Obviously, in a in a software environment, providing people with something physical, it could be a prototype. Sometimes it might even be a lo-fi prototype on paper. That's something that people much more easier to go and pick up flaws in the logic and, and so on um, than you would if you just wrote, wrote a lot of documentation. Okay, so next thing I wanted to cover is what is an MVP? So it's one of those terms which most people use it the wrong way, or I wouldn't even say it the wrong way because sometimes things take on a new meaning. Let's just say the way that it wasn't originally intended. So the term MVP, which stands for Minimal Viable Product, was popularized by Eric Ries, who wrote uh, the book, The Lean Startup. Very, very good book to read. Um, as is the, the startup way, I think, was its follow up, which is applying the same uh, thinking for large corporates. So, really, what it is, is the key word here is viable, which most people miss. They think it's it's actually the first release. It's identifying what is your biggest risk or your biggest risks and assumptions and how what's the cheapest, fastest way that we can test them to see whether the, whether they're valid or not. So that is actually what an MVP is. So, so it's uh, the fastest way that we can actually collect learning, run experiments, test our hypotheses to see whether we're on the right track or, or not. Um, if you think about it, the worst way you could, or the, or the slowest, most expensive, um, least efficient way of testing your hypothesis is to build an entire system, because that's going to take you much longer than to run experiments along along the way. Um, normally, the first release would be a minimal marketable product in, in his language. But these days, a lot of people, when they talk about MVP, they think it's the first release, Okay, but it's, it's not the intention. So in the movies, they've got a lot of uh, doc builds with some nice prototypes and goes through various different scenarios to go and test out his his hypotheses. And obviously, they, they kind of work, but normally there's a few uh, curve balls, which no one picked up. So in the first movie, uh, this is actually where this is what AI did about uh, joining the uh, the the power cables for when the clock tower struck. I did think that was a little bit too maybe a little bit too risque for tonight's talk. So I asked the AI engine to rather do a Disney version. So that's what the, the Disney version there. Um, 
And um, yeah, so, so, but often good prototyping will help you to pick up these potential issues. What happens with a storm and the tree falls down and then the, the wires get shorter and we can't connect them. So you can go and start testing out things and you'll pick up, if you've got good prototyping, you can pick up a lot of these issues, which you would never ever do um, if you just are reading you know, words inside a document. Okay, so now another question for you, because it's also time for me to have another sip of my beer. That's that's how, how I plan my talk. So when I ask a question, I can have a quick, quick pause. Um, obviously, this is a very busy traffic circle. I do have a traffic circle close to my house, which, uh, in, which they built a few years ago, which inspired this example. Um, so if you think about uh, a traffic circle, what's the biggest risk? If you've got flow of traffic and you're going to put in a circle to alleviate the flow of traffic or to, to improve the flow of traffic, your biggest risk is that you're going to actually make it worse. So what is the quickest, easiest, fastest way we could test whether our traffic circle would make the, the flow of traffic better, worse, or make no difference? Anyone got any ideas? Pop them into the chat. Okay, so Caroline's gone with the, the, the techie option, computer simulation. So it is one way that would definitely be better than doing it. Okay, Lindsay, temporary lights. Okay, yeah. Just to check if there are any others. Okay, maybe a flyover is a better option, but we want to test that before we go and invest in it. Okay, toy prototype. Okay, so if you don't have a computer simulation, you could do a quick toy prototype to go and check it. Okay, um, and Adrian, you have got the answer, the, 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 uh, what I would consider the best known answer to date. Yeah, put some cones in a circle. Yeah, so cones or drum in a circle. We can then do it. The problem with the simulation is that we might not pick up all the variables. So in the case of the one near my house, the, the busy one of the busiest ones goes up a hill and is kind of blind on the right. So people have to really slow down in the circle. So the one near my house has made the traffic much worse, not, not better. Um, so um, yeah, so the best way would be yeah, to put a temporary, construct a temporary traffic circle and then observe. Take the data before and right, in, in right peak, peak um, traffic periods and take the data afterwards and see, is this improving it or making it worse or staying the same? If it's not improving it, don't change it. Now you might want to do other things. I see someone put in there, um, you know, you could do uh, a you know, temporary traffic light. So you could do that. You could also have a pointsman or a pointswoman there to go and, you know, also direct traffic because they can actually then simulate the light um, as well to go and yeah, see what is the best option. Maybe the best option is actually closing one of the roads. You could do an experiment there, one of the, the roads, or maybe at a peak time that you just, you know, you close them off or something like that. There's potentially lots of different options. We could do a flyover. Sorry, I forget who did the flyover. That would be probably quite an expensive option, um, but maybe it's, it's the appropriate one. So you'd want to try and do a few experiments before you go and pull concrete down. So obviously in my case, they've made the traffic worse, not better. So it's quite frustrating uh, dealing with that traffic circle. I did see a couple of people. Uh, I saw, saw Esther, who I know, and I see Ian's on the Ian's on the call um, as well, who I also know. Uh, so incidentally, it's the traffic circle by the, the um, uh, um, where uh, Bryanson Drive uh, starts, with, a, with actually where the park run starts at Riverside Centre. So yeah, I'm sorry, a traffic circle is the same as a roundabout. Yeah, so what you would call a, a, a roundabout, I think, in the UK. Maybe the big problem is no one knows how to use them. Okay, so maybe that's the problem. We'd have to re-educate all the drivers. Um, so yeah, maybe that's beyond the scope of what we are able able to do. Okay, so fast, quick learning, and then we act on the results. Okay, so we're going to hop into part two of this. So this is just, um, and I will. Each part will get uh, get progressively faster. So um, we'll, we'll less slides. So just what I want to illustrate here is how we can transform a bad feature into a good hypothesis. It's take an ugly caterpillar of a feature and transform it into a butterfly. So on the screen is an example of what I would call a bad feature. So you can read this, but there's no way anyone on this call will understand what this team is trying to do. Most of the people in the room when I ran a a feature exercise with them. They were on the team that were going to build this. They didn't know what this was about either. Now, luckily, the product owner was in the room, so we had this discussion. So saying, okay, um, what are we doing? What's the benefit? We need to update order report fields for our customers. Why do we need to update these fields so they can check for errors? How do they check for errors? How does this work? Well, they check the reports to prevent errors being processed, missed errors waste time, and cause frustration. So what exactly is the current problem? Customers can't see all the relevant information or order reports, so many errors are still processed. What's the intended result? 
will reduce by error rate by 95%. So bam, five questions later, and we've got our hypothesis. We think that if we do this, if we update the audit report, we'll reduce customer errors by 95%. Okay. So that's how we finished. Now, you'll see on this whiteboard, to say also which will enhance the client experience. In hindsight, I would cross that out. Yes, we think so, but that's much harder to prove. We can prove the error rate straight away. So that's our hypothesis. The rest is just going to be a distraction. Okay, so try and keep it simple and focused. Now, also, what in retrospect, we should have actually started with our mission, our outcome, reduce client, in this case, with foreign exchange transaction error rate by 95%. Now, I was in the session. No one in the room, including myself, thought of any other options other than updating the audit report. So maybe there was a better way of doing this, but no one thought of any creative solutions. We all acted like cogs in a machine. We're going to update the audit report, and we think this will happen. So you generally want to start um, start with a problem before you get into solution mode. As I said, most times things come through already as solutions. Now, if you compare option A and option B, now these are very leading questions because option A is in red, option B is in green, and that's for a, for a reason. Would you prefer to update some fields and order report? Nah, that's pretty boring. Whereas reducing client error is by 95%, that gives me a reason to get up in the morning. You know, it's something I can brag to my wife and kids about. This is the value that I added this week, you know, for, for my organization. So just reiterating outcomes over outputs. So outcomes are much, much better than outputs. So we want to try and get things in uh, phrased as, as outcomes. Right. So um, in, I'm going to give you a South African example now. So glad there are a few, few uh, um, uh, South Africans on the call. So we do have this thing called load shedding. Okay. So load shedding is essentially rolling blackouts because we've got a state-owned uh, monopoly on, on electricity. And uh, due to, I guess, a, a combination of corruption and ineptitude, at the moment, we've got about 12 hours of electricity a day. Okay, so I had a high priority need or a household had a high priority need. We need to do something about load shedding, about loading, rolling blackouts in, in our household. Now, traditionally, what we would do, let me just pop these all on the screen, we'd go through a big period of analysis. And we might do it poorly, okay, just investigating things. We might be more specific and come up with, something like this. We want to, what do we want to do? What's the why here? We want to understand the different cost benefits and drawbacks between solar inverter generator, secondary power options, so we can make an informed decision. The problem with this is it's still going to take a long time before we've got a solution. So what I want to just show you now is just a way, an illustration about how to reframe things and how to get so we can actually chase value much, much faster. So instead of tracing off this big thing, lots of money, uh, very, very expensive and takes a bit of time to go and do it, so let's rather understand the problem we're trying to solve. So we'll say, what's the best thing since sliced bread? In South Africa, the best thing is actually having a toaster that you can, uh, with a steady supply of electricity, so you can toast your bread. But failing that, you want to understand what the problem is uh, to, to be solved. So in my household, what are the problems to be solved? I need Wi-Fi, okay, during load shedding so I can connect to work and, and connect to Teams calls. So I think it was about, it was probably uh, just under two years ago, Adrian, when I was last, last at a webinar, uh, for you. And I remember I actually should go into the office to go and do it because we had load shedding. We would be in darkness. I would be in darkness right now uh, otherwise as well if I didn't have a, a solution. So, okay, need to have that. I've got lots of English blood and I like my cup of tea in the morning. So if I don't have my tea in the morning, I'm very, very grumpy. So I need to be able to make tea in the morning and do uh, basic cooking uh, during load shedding. Uh, you saw earlier, if you've got young kids, you've got to have Netflix or other entertainment options for them. So we needed to be able to watch Netflix, other streaming services during load shedding. And we want a reasonable amount of light around the house uh, while we've got no electricity. Now, in our context, we actually got enough tablets and laptops and things like that with battery power that provided we've got Wi-Fi, we could still watch Netflix. And we actually had a few little solar solutions and solar lamps and things like that. So that was actually taken care of. But these two over, other two over there, they still needed to be <clears throat> sorted out. So now I just reframed it. How much time being more specific? Five hours. Okay. So sometimes at the moment, depending, we've got these levels of load shedding. Uh, so, so at the moment, we are like four hours, four and a half hours sometimes. So five hours will cover us uh, for load shedding. Um, so now we've restated the problem and there was actually a very easy solution. So buy a couple of, of cheap UBSs and buy a, 
a cheap gas cooker as well. So now I've covered my Wi-Fi. I've covered my tea in the morning. You can cook things like rice and steak or whatever else you want to cook on the gas cooker. So we've got a solution. So that probably costs about a thousand rands. So that's about 50 pounds um, to go and do it. And we had the solution within a few days. So the, the big constraint was actually getting the stuff uh, delivered because we ordered online. So nice, easy solution to get immediate value. Now, obviously, you might in the long run still want to do a full solar solution, which actually, incidentally, we have eventually done. That's why I do have lights and stuff like that uh, on, on now. Um, but I can tell you it is uh, significantly more expensive than that and takes a lot longer. And obviously, when you're spending lots of money, you want to make you're very, very sure you're spending it on the right things. So, But most of the problems are solved right up front very, very quickly. So try to, to yeah. So just an illustration about how to try to reframe. So now onto part three of our back to the feature trilogy. So let's revisit password reset. Okay. So um, yeah, a couple of AI pictures. I've got a. I, what I did find, I, I know there's been a lot of talk about how sometimes machine learning and AI can be um, almost like biased, and the bias of users come through. What I found was quite interesting is that firstly that they did make uh, they turned because obviously this is this is now Marty McFly who's turned into a female and Doc is just younger. So actually, they but I found though anyway the AI the graphics engines I use were were a lot more diversity conscious and but they might have been a bit ages because everything came out a bit younger. So I did ask this engine, can you make them a bit older? And that's what they came up with. So uh, yeah, anyway, so yeah. Now in the movies, obviously there's a lot of calculations and uh, everything is riding on. The DeLorean hitting 88 miles miles per hour. Um, but what if our calculations are incorrect? So once again, here we've got a, a, a yeah um, AI image. So one, this one interestingly that turned Doc into into a much younger lady, and Marty still stays looking fairly the same. So I did try another one. This is what it would look like uh, in Barbie format. So there's a way to Barbie your images as well. Um, and what I just thought I'd do is just a quick a B test of which one you prefer. So I, I was like, which one do we do? Which one's prefer? So I thought I'd let, let you all vote. So there should be a poll popping up on the screen. I'll let you have a, a vote about which one of those two you prefer. Yeah, so we have um 74% that say graphic novel and 26% say Barbie. Okay. So we got a pretty a pretty definitive uh uh, yeah, you know, we got a pretty pretty definitive result there. Okay, so just an example. Obviously, it's a a bit of a fun example. Might say, okay, well, yeah. Next time I do the presentation, oh no, let's use this one over here. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's quite a weird picture, like half a coconut and and things like that. So yeah, what 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 Doc is actually holding there is uh, the uh, the the controller for the for the car. Okay. See? Okay, so for password reset, this was the Agile Pilot on a large transactional banking system. It was my first foray into the world of Agile. Um, in the past, it would have taken about two to three years. We actually went back and looked at, at features, and we were taking about two to three years to deliver something of an equivalent size uh, to password reset. And we managed to deliver the whole thing in six weeks. Uh, we didn't split it up. It was quite a. It was um, with a. It was kind of like a big of a big feature. We live in six weeks. So this was fantastic. We said, great, this agile stuff works. We had a nice party with pizza and beer. A couple of people got a boat trip to Mauritius. It's part of an incentive rewards program uh, off the back of this. Um, but the fine print, okay, was it actually really a success? Unfortunately, the graph you're looking at over here is over a year after that last slice of pizza was eaten and the last beer was drunk. So actually we built it, we declared success and we went on, carried on building more stuff, but no one had bothered to check as anyone using this. I think I was the first person because I wanted to use this as an example in a in a in a talk, and I, I still use an example, but obviously in a totally different context. And that's the danger. And this this you might think this is an extreme example, but it happens all the time. We build things, we're so confident it will work, no one actually checks afterwards. I can tell you this one also didn't have the hypothesis that I showed you about reducing call center volumes. I think there's a much higher likelihood action would have been taken quicker if it was. It was written as we'll save 800,000 Rand, which no one then. Uh, and I can also tell you that when we eventually did uh, properly take it live, we'd find out all the numbers, all the mobile phone numbers were incorrect. So, um, yeah. 
Now, um, humans are, are terrible at predicting value. We like to think we're very much overconfident. Um, the guy on screen here is a guy called Ron Kohavi. So I first became aware of him when I read the DevOps handbook. Um, there's a quote there. There's a more succinct quote than I believe it. Basically, what he's saying is that one in three changes will result in the intended improvements. So he started at Amazon. We started doing A-B testing there and uh, moved to, you know, headed up Microsoft's experimentation platform, and then he went to Airbnb. Um, so he's got a nice, a nice CV uh, full of stuff. But basically, yeah, the experiments that he's run in controlled environments, clever people, stable systems, you know, one in three actually has the intended result. What do you actually find? One in three makes no change, but adds to your legacy code. One in three has a negative result, like a traffic circle ends up slowing things down. I, I call this Kohavi's law, that only one change in three will yield a positive result. The cor corollary being actually two, or three, two out of three of ideas will have an imp uh, no detectable impact or negative outcome. So you want to go and test stuff as quickly as possible afterwards. Um, another quote from him, he says, evaluating ideas with controlled experience was humbling. It showed how poor intuition and expert opinions are. Um, there's lots of examples out there. I've actually got a, a talk called Harry, Harry Potter and the Quest for Business Value, which goes through the whole thing. It, and the Ron in my story, obviously got Harry and Ron. The Ron in my story is Ron Kohavi uh, in that one. Okay. Another way he expresses, he says, my job is to tell people that their babies are ugly. Okay, so their pet projects are just not going not gonna to work. Um, so I'm just going to, I won't run these exercises. I'm just going to illustrate them quickly. You can see them through um, just in the interest of, of time. So there's time for a little couple of questions. Um, so if you think about your bank account, okay, we've all got a bank account. You've um, <clears throat> probably got a banking app. So if you needed to have, if you're building a banking system and 10 reports, how many features do you have? The best answer is at least 10. Okay, so you would have each one of those reports is a separate feature because there's separate value in it, but you might do a simple version, a complex version of a report. I might be able to do a simple version in one day. The complex one might take me one week or one month, um, you know, if I'm doing much more complicated stuff on that report. Um, if you think about you as a user of a banking system, you look at your balance. It's the first thing you look at. Okay, how much money do I have? And that will be for every single banking user. Um, the second most important is you look at your transactions. So how much money don't I have? Where did all my money go is the next thing you look at. Now, when you start going down the list, which is the third, and if I run this as an exercise, um, people start struggling, even with the third report, which is the third most one. You can think about yourself, which you look at in your own banking account. You, and fourth, fifth, sixth, you really struggle after that. There are probably, if you actually have to look at the number of reports in your banking app, it's probably close to 100 but if I had to ask you what they are, there are very few that you could name, even though you're a user. So you just get diminishing returns. So what you want to do is split these things up and you get the most value uh, with, the, with the least amount of, of work. Even if you think about something like beneficiaries, you've got a simple beneficiary report, okay? Just me as a user, my beneficiaries, it's easy to build. If you start adding things like last three transactions, now you're hitting transactional databases, much you've got more non-functionals there and then you've got questions like what if i've never paid this person what if i paid them five years ago do we still show it if i paid them twice or once what do we show now all of those things get much much more complex so you, it's probably about 10 times the size of the simple beneficiaries report to do the more advanced one so split it into two um and let me let me actually skip this one over there. I'll just do the last slide. So there'll be just be a couple of minutes for questions. So um, one of the key themes throughout this uh, the Back to the Future trilogy has been about out, uh, outputs of uh, versus outcomes and why outcomes are better. So if you, the output as a talk is complete, uh, barring a few questions. But really, there's if you've if you've had a you know enjoyed it, but but haven't learned anything, then we all wasted our time. So really, I guess the outcome. The design outcome would be that uh, you can take uh, get some takeaways from the talk and uh, yeah work with uh, great quality features and hypotheses on your on your backlogs and start experimenting uh, with with feature hypotheses if you're not already. Um, right, so let's uh, yeah. I don't know if there's time fantastic. for so thank, two. Thank, thanks, thanks very much, Stuart. No, I, I mean a fantastic uh, talk there, as I'm sure uh, everyone who's tuning in live will agree. Um, slight technical issue with the recording in that I, I, it, normally it starts from automatically and I'd paused it. And so we missed an initial chunk of the recording. We've got most of this, but Stuart, would you send me your slides after? Because what I'll do is I'll kind of mock up. I'll, I'll make sure that we, we, we get the content to people 
even if it's a combination of the slides and the video are you okay to send the slides on yeah yeah sure yeah no no problem cool, yeah if you send them if you send them to me afterwards then I'll, I'll sort all that out so uh fantastic well let's just uh we'll have probably question time for maybe two questions uh so the first question is from uh Oluwabori, uh, apologies if I'm mispronouncing your, your name there. Uh, shouldn't a user story deliver value to the user or customer? And uh, uh, I believe that that is the so that part of the user story definition. What's your response to that one, Stuart? Yeah, so there's a lot of, I mean, so user stories were originally created as a placeholder for future conversation um, by um, Alistair Coburn, and they were popularized by, by um, uh, Kent Beck in his Extreme Programming book. That, that as a format, um, was um, uh, I think a lady Rachel Davies um, kind of she kind of did that that format, but it was always meant to be a placeholder for future conversation. So so it wasn't meant to be for detailed analysis. It was actually just meant to capture a thought, pop it in your backlog. So you spend ten seconds capturing the idea, but it's not today's problem. It's not this week's problem. It's not the sprint's problem. It's a future problem to to sort out. So so um, I would argue that that kind of thinking is what I would, would, would in, the, in this presentation, what I've used as the feature is you capture it there and then you're going into, you know, because ideally what you want is actually on a daily basis, you're seeing progress with stories being completed because you've got fully built, fully tested software. So you know that you're getting closer. The danger is if you've got a really big user story, it's like a truck on a highway. All the traffic behind it gets clogged up and if something goes wrong with a with truck and invariably it will with software, everything else gets stuck and your roads get gridlocked. Whereas if you've got your small stories, you're doing them fast. So, so what people, I guess, traditionally think of as a user story, I would more look as a feature. I, I like writing features in that, in that format. I find that if you write user stories in that format, some teams it works, but a lot of times it gets more convoluted. You can just write it in, in plain, plain English. Um, I used to be quite pedantic about it when I started agile coaching. These days I'm more about what's working for the team. If the team is delivering consistently in value, that's the right answer. Fantastic. So um, we're, we're just, I literally like, we've got about two, two minutes less, left. So in, in like a 30 seconds, um, Parometer uh, asks, um, ha, like, you know, agree that we don't need to document, any, you know, everything, but how do you maintain knowledge? So, you know, in five years time, people aren't going to be going through user stories or whatever. So like in a few words, how do you maintain that organizational knowledge? Uh, your automated tests. Okay, would be the short answer. So like debits and credits in an accounting system, if your something's not working, check either your production system or your tests and fix it there. So that's the best way to learn uh, how a system works is to go through those. You can never, ever keep your documentation in sync with production. I've tried. I tried when I ran an analysis team. It's impossible. It's 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 just, you know, it's out of date before it goes live in production and you're just never going to keep it in sync. Whereas your, your tests, your automated tests and your production system, that's the best way to do it. In, in my in my knowledge, yeah. Fantastic. Well, excellent. Uh, and apologies to anyone that, that we didn't get to the question. Time is uh, is always up against us with these things. And Stuart, you you know you've, you've imparted so much really thought provoking knowledge. Thank you again uh, for for the time you've taken there. But we are at time. So all that's left for me to say is a massive thank you to everyone who has attended live for all of the questions you put in the chat and so on. Uh, Thank you again, Stuart. Again, apologies for the slight technical issue with the uh, with the recording. So thanks once again. Excellent. And uh, see you all next time. So bye for now. But because I had to uh, re-record the beginning, I thought I'd throw in a little bit of an Easter egg. Now, in movies, uh, sometimes, or these days, it's popular to do a post credit scene or a kind of a, a hidden scene. So I thought I'd uh, throw in this little one that I didn't have time for uh, yesterday. Um, so... Um, Went to the questions, but hang on a minute. Let's go to our hidden scene. And um, I wonder how many people who are watching this webinar actually read the abstract beforehand. Probably not that many. Um, but for those who did, there was something that I actually didn't cover inside this. Um, and originally when I did this talk, it was at a conference. Um, and what happened was that I, I, was, uh, I got a bit bored. Uh, I was talking on day two. Uh, the keynote wasn't the best keynote ever. I got a bit bored and I was just scrolling through the the, the conference app. I thought, well, let me look at my my uh, abstract again. And I suddenly realized that I had my nice talk, but I hadn't included one item. So I thought that I'd play that into the whole talk about why written documentation uh, is, is not the best way to communicate. Because very often people just don't read stuff. And even if they do, they don't understand everything. 
So yeah, I doubt that anyone who read the abstract would have realized that there was one thing that I promised to cover, which I haven't covered uh, inside the webinar. And that was how an innovation day can change the paradigm and move you to documentation list deployment. So that is the hidden scene, which I'll cover now. So it's a lovely, lovely story, which I still often use. Um, it did an innovation day, uh, which is highly recommended. Uh, I think innovation days are fa fantastic. Um, and there's always this debate between um, using uh, an actual system and having st uh, physical storyboards. So there's benefits of both, but the problem is then you've got a bit of overhead, a bit of duplication. Um, so I generally, as an agile coach, would suggest to people to do both. There's something great about the tactile nature of a board. You can change whatever you want, but it doesn't do your metrics for you automatically. And for people who remote or, or uh, management reporting, much, much more difficult on a physical board. So there's benefits of both. You want, you want both. Um, but there is this overhead. So anyway, what this team did on their innovation day, is they went out, they bought a cheap web camera, they bought QR codes, onto their uh, onto their um, user stories on on their board and as you moved your story the camera would then pick up the QR code pick up the change in status this team was using rally dev as that as a tool their workflow tool and would automatically go and update the, the tool fantastic innovation okay so nice simple uh solution in less than a day they had a working solution to solve a real world problem and make their lives easier and, and, and more efficient. Now, the interesting thing with this example was they did zero written documentation to produce the actual solution. Um, they did analysis, and that's the important thing. We say that you always do analysis, but you don't necessarily have to do written documentation or you don't need to write down all your analysis because the team was communicating together. Um, and yeah, in less than a day, they came up with a working solution. So if you think about that, the Agile Manifesto working software over comprehensive documentation, a very, very good example of that. They got the working software. Okay, they didn't compromise. Now, what they did do is afterwards is that they did do some written documentation to explain how everything worked. Okay, so that, you know, for maintainability and, 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 and so on and so forth. So sometimes you can do actually a written documentation afterwards, but yeah, in a day they brought us, uh, they were able to produce a solution. Now, if you think about traditionally, what would have happened, I would have had to go and write up a justification to go and buy this web camera and do stuff. We then maybe it would get approved, maybe it wouldn't. Okay. And then we'd go through this long cycle of several months um, and I'll do some analysis, maybe if it was approved, but it'll probably be several months before the first line of code is written. Now, following that traditional process in several months before the first line of code is written, compared to in a day, we've got, well, less than a day, actually, we've got a fully built, fully tested working solution. Obviously, I'm not going to condescend you and ask you which one's better. The answer is obvious. Okay, so um, just a nice example then, um, yeah, about how this kind of all, all, all fits together. Anyway, thanks for, for, for watching. And uh, if you would like to connect on social media, always, uh, always very, very keen to, to connect with people. So, yeah hit me up and I'll uh, see, see you on the internet. Cheers. Bye.